I'm Amy Jordan, and this is Yes, But Why Podcast. Yeah. And it wasn't until I went to high school that I found out I lived in the ghetto. Um, <laughs> you know, when you're a kid, you're just, living, you know you're just living your life. Yeah. Yeah, you're just living your life. And then you get to school and they're like, where are you from? You're like, I live on the north side. You tell them the streets. And they're like, you live in a really bad neighborhood. And I'm like, no, I don't. And they're like, yeah, you do. And uh, yeah, I did. But whatever. It is what it is. Uh, you didn't notice, I guess. Yeah, that's that's pretty good. No, you, this is just this is where you live, right? It's that's just true. like I guess everything's like this, right? Yeah, um, I guess so. Yeah, yeah I guess right. I mean, how, yeah, what, totally. what do you know? And then yeah, and Riverside was on the east side of the the of the city, and like maybe like four or five blocks from the waterfront from Lake Michigan. And so, yeah, you walk off campus towards the lake, and all of a sudden there are these huge houses, and you're like, oh, I guess I guess I do live in a bad neighborhood. <laughs> well, yeah, but good I didn't that you didn't notice until so, they told you. Yeah, I was just like, no, that's something from TV or movies. But yeah, no, whatever. Um, it was just kind of a funny moment. <laughs> it always sticks out to me that I was just like, what? I guess so. Um, you know what, though? I feel like that is a great indicator of like, I don't know, a lot of things in life. Like you don't, you didn't have to listen to them. You didn't have to accept yeah. that the neighborhood that they deemed bad was bad. I mean, it's a judgment call. Like you were like, I'm fine. Look, I'm alive. Look, people are fine. Wow. My neighbors are okay. Like no big deal. Did you like, yeah. was it like a, you know, glass shattering over your head? Did you like go back and all of a sudden it was all like, oh my God, Tom, no, I... the nice guy in the corner is really selling crack. Oh no. Like, What's happening? No, I just, you know, took the bus an hour every day to and from school and went about my business. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I also like, you know, when I was in grade school, I went to, uh, this is all the boring stuff. We should just skip ahead to like when I turned 47 or 45 or whatever. Um, but yeah, I went to like a private ease into it. (laughs) Oh no, seriously. Everything, everything from childhood till, uh, August of 2015 is so boring. I've done so much in the last three years, um, that the previous part of my life was embarrassing. It was embarrassing. I did so little, uh, (laughs) But uh, because remember, uh, January of 2016 is when I came and spent the month with the month with you all in Austin. Oh yeah. And um, yeah, and that was six months. I I had decided to get divorced in August, and I had yeah. been married 23 years. And that period from the time I moved out of the house to the time, I'd say halfway through my trip to Austin with you guys, was just like the worst stretch of my life. Um, like I moved out and like, I was happy to get divorced. Obviously it's the best thing that ever happened to me, but it was just like these emotional things and these big life changes. And then, um, like almost immediately after I kind of came out, like only two or three people, two people exactly knew that I was, um, I, well, back then I called it cross-dressing, but now I'm obviously transgender. Um, I came out and I just decided like, when I go out, if I want to go out, um, like my true self, I'm going to do it. And that kind of got me confidence, but it was still like a lot to be processing. And then, um, in October, my dad died and we weren't close in any way, but it's just like another thing that's on the plate. And then, uh, like shortly thereafter that one of my stand up students who had cancer died. And then like three weeks before I was supposed to come to Austin, I was in a car accident. And then, um, the first two weeks in, Austin, like I definitely got the vibe that the person who had told me to come out and be a guest in residence and really filled in a lot of you guys at the theater that that was happening. Um, like I would show up for shows and people would be like, I'd be like, Hey, I'm on this show. And they'd be like, okay. Uh, but by the end of that trip, like I just gotten my stuff together. And since then, yeah, that the last week and week and a half in Austin really kind of like, 
uh, sent me soaring, and I've just been living life to the fullest since then. Um, what inspired like you said, in that group. moment? Like, what got you? What lit the fire under you in that moment? Well, I think um, one thing that that's weird is, you know, when I was a kid, and I, I don't know if this tried, tried, you know, this ties to my my gender issues or whatever, you know, I really didn't speak up for myself. I kind of just did what I was told by my parents. Um, and then I lived with my parents even through college, which if you're a college age kid, do not live with your parents. When Nothing against your parents. Just move out, be on your own for those four years. Yeah. And then immediately after college, I got married. Um, and then we moved to where she was getting her PhD. And so like, my entire life, I just moved wherever she wanted to move for work is where we moved. I really didn't help have any hopes and dreams of my own. And um, probably 2003, I started improv and started performing and really enjoyed it and started getting goals for that. But a lot of it was I would hold myself back as like, well, we're not moving from here because of her job. And um, once I was free of that, I was just like, well, now you, I don't have any excuses anymore. Like, I can't, I can't not take an opportunity or not do something that's like, well, this is holding me back. And so I just kind of go for everything that I can. And, um, you know, it kind of feels good to be good enough to do that. Um, yeah. I feel like, so like improv, I, I feel like improv years. helped me a lot with that. Yeah. So you really just been jumping into getting more involved. Like, so earlier when you got involved but you were still held back were you still performing and stuff or were you only sort of like involved in a limited capacity and i mean that can take all sorts of forms um right but like so you were you were performing and you like got into improv thankfully um but like yeah. it just didn't quite fully suss out for a, a bunch more years well yeah so when i first started you know i started with a group and we just did short form and that's fine i have nothing against people who do their, like short form but i've noticed for me as a as a performer i kind of get bored with everything i do if i don't make it harder and like push myself to be um to to to, to challenge myself like if i if i'm not afraid to do a show then i'm like are you really challenging yourself enough to do this um, and so when you first start, you know, you're kind of just tapped to be like, hey, we got a, we got a show every month. We rehearse four times a week and that's enough. And then, uh, I started doing long form and I auditioned for a troupe in Richmond. I started doing stand up and just, you know, there were times where I was like, I'd really love to go on a tour, but I was held back because, you know, I was married. This person I was married to didn't have, a, didn't even have a driver's license. So she was responsible for me to get her to work and stuff. And, if I was gone for long periods of time, there was kind of like the guilt trip of like, well, I've got to find someone to get me to work. And I'm like, well, you're 35 years old, you know, <laughs> you should have a way to get to work. Um, yeah. And then, like I said, I mean, I, we, we decided to get divorced on a Sunday and Monday I contacted, um, I contacted Chris about coming out to, it was the new movement at the time. Um, and he was like, yeah, let's do it. Why I mean, did you that's decide how quickly... to take a trip for like a month? Was it just to get out of your space? Yeah, I was just like, I'm, I was, I was just at this point where it's like, you know what? I feel, uh, and I feel like we're taught not to talk about ourselves like this, but I felt like, you know, I'm pretty good at this and I can do stuff. Yeah. And, um, you know, positive or negative about Chris, you know, he had always been someone who was open to talk to. And like, I don't know if you get a lot of people who like, you try to talk to them about like being successful and they, they don't, they act like it's a state secret and they don't want to help you. And so, um, whatever, whatever we all think about Chris now, like, I appreciate that he was just like super open to doing that for me. Um, and like I said, it kind of gave me that confidence. And then when I came down there, you know, the people I worked with were amazing and had a great student show. Uh, we taught three straight weeks of my, I took my, my two hour class and kind of got real intensive for three weeks with this group of students and their student show was amazing. And I had a great time and yeah. it kind of, it also, I feel like a lot of people, like if you're in an improv theater right now and like you took classes at a theater and you're now you auditioned to be on a house team or you're, or you're doing a regular show there. There's like these people at the theater who are like the people, you know, the people who were there before you were there and you look up to them. 
And so it kind of helped me also to just be out there. And like, I go to places now and I'm like, I'm my own person, you know, they're like, yeah. this person's amazing, you know? And so like, there's this kind of individuality that I'm kind of striving for as well. Not that I have anything against uh, improv theaters or being a part of theater. That's great. But sometimes you just need to, to find that, um, find your own happiness and what that means and how that occurs. And it's just like going out to a different theater and like meeting new people and having them validate that what you're doing is good, you know? Um, yeah. Plus like traveling and doing, you know, sharing the craft is great. Like the fact that you came to teach was wonderful. You know, we got to experience a new, uh, a new person and like a new point of view. And we're all agreed that improv was a great thing that we wanted to do. And I mean, don't get me wrong. Like, uh, I, <laughs> I would consider myself both a hermit and a, uh, arms <laughs> wide open improviser like I'm ready right. to yes and anyone I want to teach classes and workshops that like open people's hearts and like fill them with the empathy that they need to live in this world but I also want to yeah. be in my house with my door locked and not talk to anybody so like you know I think it's <laughs> everybody you know and then I mean, also I have, to the have... same extent you want to be a performer like if you want to perform and be out there sometimes it's hard if you especially too if you haven't found like a troupe or other people that like you really connect with you have to go out on your own and like you know express what you have inside of you we're all artists in that way for sure yeah and so um yeah once I started doing long form obviously I got through that and I started to push myself to do more and more stuff and um, I directed a few, um, like improvised TV shows, like improvised sitcom and improvised, um, documentary. And then, um, I've always wanted to be like, I always wanted to do a one person show. And the one thing that always held me back was that I felt like there was for some reason that there was a way you had to do it. So I was always like trying to ask people like, well, how do you do this? What do you do? And then one day I realized like, you know, I've seen a bunch of them and everyone's just doing whatever the hell they want. So I, um, wrote a show that was like a bunch of sketches and it kind of told my artist, my growth as an artist. And um, the first half was like sketches and that I had written like monologues and stuff. And then the second half, I got people in the audience on stage to, I had someone who just, I wanted people to be artistic. And so I had some lady draw while the show was going on. And one lady wrote a poem and then read it after she was done. And then I got someone on stage who had never done improv and gave them like a two minute improv lesson. And then we did like a 15 minute set and it was just like this wild and crazy thing. And I kind of, uh, kind of have embraced that. And like the current one person show I do is just like improvised. And I kind of think about it while I'm driving around. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> <coughs> it's interesting um, i recently spoke to somebody and they said that they took a one person um workshop like a solo sketch or solo performance workshop clearly that person yeah. who taught that workshop thinks there's one specific way to do it but yeah i think i'm in your camp of, like a one person show is just that one person's show it's like a stand-up well, i show. think um yeah, yeah. Not always well, the same. Yeah, mine is more um like I said I've I it's called Wisconsin Laugh Trip and basically it's basically characters that I've met while traveling the country or that I've invented in the car or whatever and I'll just pick a voice that I'll pick like five or six voices I want to do that night and then I'll ask the audience a different question for each voice and I'll just do a monologue as that character and see how it goes. Um <laughs> but yeah, I feel like if I if I taught a one person improv class like a for how to develop your own, I'd be like focus on what you like like what do you love to do? What do you love most about performing? And um what do you have to say, you know? It uh it kind of helped me once I realized like honestly, all I want when I'm on stage is for everyone to have as much fun as I'm having. Um and and it's like, it's amazing when you're just like there and like, yes, people are laughing, but it's also like afterwards, they're just like, this is the most fun I've ever had. And I'm, that, that just hits me right where it is. Uh, I'm not out there trying to be the most hilarious person in the world. I just want to be joyful and bring that to the people who have come out to see the show, you know? Yeah. That's so nice. 
That's super fun. Yeah. I like that. You want to share the joy that you found in the world. Did you, do you think before you, um, got divorced and kind of, you know, broke out of your shell, do you think you knew what your voice was, your like creative voice, or do you think it came with this, this transformation? Um, I think it's a thing that it, it came, you know, I mean, I started improv in 2003, I got divorced in 2015. So I think it kind of developed, um, it, it slowly comes out. Like a lot of times I feel like, especially when you're a performer, uh, especially when I was doing stand up when I first started, you find like the stand ups you look, you like, and you try to be them and it never works out because it's not you. So I think doing stand up more kind of helped me, um, feel out who I was on stage. And it wasn't, it was, it was that thing. It was this, I want everyone in the room to have fun when I'm on stage. And, um, then once I got divorced and started, um, started being Ellie, you know, um, I feel it has gotten easier because I am super happy for the first time in my life. You know, uh, it's, it's a weird feeling to, you know, be, I, I mean, I'm turning 48 this month and like only in the last two or three years being like amazingly happy with where I am and what I'm doing. Um, so Did yeah, I feel like, out feel like you said how old you were. Nah, whatever. <laughs> no, then they can go. No way, you're 48. There's no way. That's what we're looking for. You're too. You, I thought you. I thought you were mid 30s, and I'm like, well, thank you. Well, um, I am. But yes, my grandmother was 37 yeah. till the day she died. Sure. Why not? Yeah. I always feel like, um, yeah, I, I, I um. There's, yeah, there's no need to hide my age, really. Um, it's kind of, I always just joke about it. I think part of it is like doing improv has kept me young. Like I'm, you know, a good 15 years older than everyone else doing improv where I'm from. So well, I think that, I'm, uh, uh, works I actually have this theory about like, like sort of like what age your soul is versus how old you uh -huh. are. And I feel like when you finally feel like yourself, that's how old you were supposed to be. You know what I mean? Like, oh like when I turned like, how old was I? 36, 36. I was like, uh -huh. yeah, this is right. This is cool. I'm 40 now. Uh -huh. So I'm a little past it. And I really now being a few years past it, I'm like, yeah, 36 is how old I am. Like, that's it. Okay. My grandmother really had it. She got it and she called it out. She just said, I'm 37 forever. But that's just how old she was on the inside. Think about those little kids. You ever meet a little kid who's like super old? Like, especially yeah. with actors, like so especially, wise. oh my God, I, yeah. I taught this, um, I taught this kid's acting course and this girl, she's legitimately seven years old. Okay. Seven years old, this girl uh -huh. in human years, she was older yeah. than me. I mean, she was like Meryl Streep. She was just like, right. the way she performed, like, I was like, are you kidding me right now? What, what is happening? You know, she's seven. But, you know, people are, you know, whatever age they are in the inside, I suppose. Huh. Maybe. You, I mean, I don't know. That's just something I've I mean, I've I, sort like of I noticed. said, I don't feel, I don't feel like I'm almost 50. Um, I don't act like I'm almost 50. Maybe it's more of a thing like uh, you, your soul doesn't start until you uh, truly find yourself. So maybe I'm 48, maybe. but with the soul of a three-year-old. <laughs> anything to justify any, anything one. to justify my mischievousness is fine with me <laughs> <laughs> mischievousness that's nice i like that yeah 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 that's good do you find you're you're more uh mischievous now are you doing wild and uh -huh. crazy things oh god yes <laughs> we don't need to get into this on a podcast for public distribution, but yes. I, oh, uh, good. Please, let's censor it. Beep, beep, beep. We're not telling anyone anything. I love it. Yeah. No, I mean, <laughs> um, I always feel, so like one thing I always feel like is, um, like, I never use drugs. Uh, sure. And I don't condone using drugs, especially for, like, young people. I feel like um, what helped me a lot is I first didn't use drugs until I was 45. Sure. and um Obviously, there's some um, there's some benefits to that, and some wisdom that you've gained by being on this earth that long. But um, 
I definitely use certain uh, substances for creative purposes. Um, yeah. And I think I think it works great for me. But yeah, I feel like if I would have discovered those things and used them a lot when I was younger, it probably wouldn't have done me any good uh, because yeah. I was not doing anything. Yeah, totally. It's always interesting to look at them as um, like helpful tools versus like, you know, something you get mired in. Right. Yeah. yeah. Like I'm like, okay. Yeah. I don't do stuff where it's like, oh yeah, let's just go get a bunch of this stuff and like just get nuts. I'm like, guys, next Saturday, I'm going to take some acid at 10 a.m. and then I'm going to just spend the day developing new characters. And everyone's like, cool. We know yeah. that now. And yeah. that's what I go do. Yeah. Yeah, it's absolutely. Very, I'm very structured and orderly. I'm very you... 48 year old with my acid consumption. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just orderly is just the thing. You don't need any age to be orderly. Speaking of which, have you watched yeah. the show? Is a Hulu show called Hamilton's Pharmacopoeia. Have you watched that show? If you haven't, no, I you haven't. Really should. Hamilton's Pharmacopoeia right. is a television show about a scientist. He's like 30, but he looks about 12. Um, uh -huh. he's this string bean of a kid, um, with glasses and he's a scientist. Like he legitimately is a scientist and he's obsessed with, um, psychedelic substances. So like he and his, uh, science uh, scientist partner, I don't know what you call them. Uh, uh, <laughs> they work on, uh, trying to figure out how certain drugs affect the body and the brain. And so the whole show is him going and finding the drug. They talk about it clinically. They try to figure out how it's made. They try to figure out how it affects them. He talks to experts and then he does the drug. And then he talks uh -huh. about what it's like while he's doing it. Like you watch him certainly doing stuff. And it's like, and then afterwards they talk about it clinically again. And it's like, this is a fascinating show because like for him, he just wants to know how it can open up your brain, which parts of your brain it's affecting. Like he's really there. I see him as like a person who's guiding people. He's like, if you want to take this, that's great, but be aware this is where it affects you. This is what's going on. So know about your brain and how it can be affected. I was like, oh, this is so interesting. So, yeah, I, it's super great. It's like all sorts of different kinds of psychedelics, different kinds of drugs. Like, and he just breaks it down and it's so fascinating. Plus he's super cute. It helps. It helps that he's super cute. Okay. Um, but Did yeah, Hamilton's it's a Pharmacopia great show. the official sponsor of this episode? <laughs> I wish. I wish. <laughs> Hamilton, call me. I wish. Yeah. Yeah. Please. please call us. Please. I'd be willing to be like a guest star and just, you know, come on and take some drugs with him <laughs> but yeah it'd be great if he did another season it's just one season on hulu and I, I it's not just it's not a hulu original series it's a yeah oh what's the name of the like it's like spike or something no it's uh oh geez it's the like, national network yeah, yeah it's some sort of like dude kind of channel i forget the name of it um, but it, he, cool. but it's, it's fine. It's not, <laughs> it's not, it's not terrible. It's not like every three, uh, uh, three shots. There's like, you know, chicks in bikinis, like taking shots or whatever. And it's weird. No, it's him and some old guys talking about ayahuasca. Like it's very, <laughs> very cool. Yeah, it's super... Very helpful. But yeah, it. I mean, but he talks about all the the people that do it often, certain ones, they'll talk about how they use it creatively. This one guy, he painted using, um, what was it, PCP. He took PCP and then he painted and he had this whole series. It was super interesting and like, it's just, it, you know, the creative uses for drugs are many. And, uh, and I yeah. figure, hey, why not? Like, if you can tap into a part of yourself uh, during the experience to actually make it work for you. Great. Better than, better than just doing it for no reason. It actually is pretty amazing when you just realize like the stuff you, this is the stuff your brain goes and like, um, you kind of lose that. Like part of the thing that helped, what, what improv really helped me with as an artist was self judging myself. You know, that self judgment where like, if you're trying to write and you're, you're full of doubt and then, harsh on yourself as I was at that age like you never write anything down because everything always sucks and when I started doing improv it's like you're on stage you don't have time to, to judge yourself you're just doing it and it kind of made me realize like oh I'm actually pretty creative and pretty good at this 
And so um, kind of whatever whatever drugs I might be taking kind of takes that even to a further level where it's like, well, now I'm not even having, you know, whatever subconscious. I'm just letting my mind go wherever it'll go and take it on a trip, you know, see where it'll take me. And I've created some weird characters based on that. I've got some stuff we're going to be working on next year that are completely insane, but uh, hilarious. And so we'll see where it goes. And then maybe it'll, maybe I'll I'll do all that stuff and it'll stink. It'll be like, well, screw this. This is dumb. I'm going back to just doing straight improv. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, improv is um, always going to be a little odd, and you have to follow. Sometimes I feel like with improv, you kind of like have to follow the zeitgeist. Like you can't just create something that's not, you know, what the world is looking for. Oh my God, for the first time ever, I'm going to have to say, hold on, because my baby is crying. I'm so sorry. No problem. Uh, That's all right. There's no problem. Here. I'm going to put you on speakerphone. Just talk when you get back. Totally. All right. I wonder if she's still recording this. I wonder, maybe I'll just leave this for the editor. Hey, how's it going? This is Ellie. So um, I just thought I'd come and talk to you guys and uh, say that uh, I'm having a blast with my life, like really for serious. Like I'm doing whatever I want and I'm succeeding because I'm just going for the things that I feel in my gut that I want. And if I could tell anyone anything, it's like that's how you should live your life. You should just figure out what you want, set your goals, and then take the steps to achieve them. And don't think of your goals as like these big lofty things that are out there. Yes, that's the ultimate plan. But you have to figure out the steps along the way. And that's what I feel so many people fail at. They like have these things they want to do, but they aren't doing the everyday things that um, make those things become reality. So like earlier this year, so this year I've traveled to Ireland. I spent a week teaching down in Alabama. I took a three-week cross-country trip. Um, I've taught in California, in North Carolina, in Boca Raton, Florida. I've performed in Brooklyn. I've performed in Tampa. I've performed uh, in Baltimore and also down in Chapel Hill. I've been doing so much. And uh, I have one of the people at the theater I usually work at go, you're doing so much. How do you do it? And all I had to tell them is, I just do it. So just go out there and figure out what you want and take the steps necessary to make those things happen. That's the only way uh, you can accomplish anything. You know, Uh, being a performer, uh, being in uh, an industry like comedy, uh, you know, it's just the breaks. People always talk about the breaks. When's your big break? Well, your break is all around you. You don't know when the quote unquote big break is going to happen. But every time you go on stage, you got to leave it all on stage. All right, because the break may not might not be some Hollywood dude who just happens to be in your little theater. That's not going to happen when I'm in Richmond. That's not going to happen when I'm performing in uh, any other small place on the East Coast. But you know what? Someone might see me who knows someone who knows someone. Uh, this past weekend, I taught a workshop in Chapel Hill, and I only had three people sign up. Uh, but one of the people who signed up has a troop in Greensboro, North Carolina. And he wants me to come down and teach them, you know, um, back-to-back days, like a six-hour intensive, like two, three-hour session. Uh, and that only happened because I went down there, and I didn't, I didn't cry because only three people signed up for my class. I said, let's have the most fun we can, and I put on a damn good class. And that's how you have to approach your work. You have to love to do it. You have to love being on stage that even if one or two people show up, you're going to put on the best damn show you can because you're doing it for yourself and you love it. And so that's what y'all need to be doing. I don't think anybody's going to make the podcast because I'm just talking to myself. Maybe she's not even recording, but if she is recording, it would be super funny. So uh, that's my advice. Do what you love. Do it because you love it. Do it as hard as you can, and things will happen for you because you're doing that. All right? All right. So what I, I wish there was like a question now. She'd just have a jump off point for uh, what's next. Um. I don't know what else to tell you guys. We talk. About... I think she's coming back. I think she's here. Hey, Ellie. Sorry. Hey, were you recording all that? Yes. Oh, cool. And they're gonna have some stuff to listen to. 
<laughs> That's fine. I'm going to make a note right here. I, pro I, I probably won't. I mean, I'll listen to it if you want me to. But Oh, I gave a nice little monologue. It's very helpful, I'm sure. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, That's I wasn't nice. just goofing off. I well, took I that opportunity to, to drop some knowledge. Oh. What's that? Well, I'm excited. That's so good. What did you, what knowledge? I mean, you don't have to redrop it, but, you know, where yeah, did it lead you? I was you? just like, uh, basically just people always ask me, like, how, like, how do you do so, so much stuff? And I was like, I go out and do it. And I feel like so often, especially with, with improv, you know, we kind of like build ourselves around these theaters and um as performers we think like we're part of the theater and but there's no there's there's nothing wrong with that like obviously we all want to have our community but you can't rely on the theater to to make your dreams come true unless your dreams are just to do like one show a month at the theater but if you have like a bigger arching goal you have to like find out what your goal is and then do the things um that make that goal achievable you know you know what I'm realizing as I'm that. getting older, too, is the idea that we are, you know, that there are many goals. It's not just one thing. Because, like, I feel right. like I've accomplished goals. And the problem with me is I, I'll i get all antsy after I'll accomplish a goal. And while most people should be excited by accomplishing a goal, I am instead, like, Oh no, but what am I going to do now? Yeah, what's next? Yeah. Um, so I, mean, I feel like that's what happens. It's also the thing where you might not even know what the goal is. Like, yeah. if you're just starting as a performer, just go out and do everything and find out what you find out what you love. Like, don't just do stand up because, well, I should do stand up, so I'm doing stand up, or don't do improv because I'm in an improv team. We do improv. Like, taste everything and give it a try and. I mean, that's what happened to me with doing a one-person show. I mean, it was daunting and everything, and um, it's it's a tremendous undertaking, but it's, like, the risk and, like, the the nerves. Like, it's amazing to be like, I'm going to go out for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, uh, and I'm just going to perform, and I really have no idea what I'm going to do. It is kind of just amazing, you know? Yeah, it's pretty wild. It really makes it worthwhile. Yeah. 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 Um, so, Plus, um, the audience gets to be in on every journey with you. Oh, I know, and and that's the best part. Is like, yeah, they're on this, they're on this amazing journey with me, and uh, I end every show with like a sing along. And so, like, if you get like a like fifty, sixty people, like the first one, I, the, my first show that I actually wrote uh, in the middle, I had a sing along to Bohemian Rhapsody, and there were like sixty, seventy people in the small theater, and we all sang along. It was amazing. Um, and just like everyone hitting all the, oh, it was beautiful. And now, um, my current show, Wisconsin Laugh Trip, is Wisconsin based. And so I end every show with Blister in the Sun by the Violent Femmes, who are, you know, Milwaukee's greatest, uh, band and that great, that band's greatest song. And everyone knows it and everyone loves it. And I invite oh, people yeah. on stage. And so, like, I've been at festivals with them and like 10 people on stage dancing and singing. And I just, I just step to the side and I let them, you know, take over the stage and enjoy the moment. Um, That's so but nice. yeah, like I feel, I feel like as much as people are watching TV or digital content or staring at their screens, like they really crave that in the moment uh, live experience. And um, like, I don't even like, I don't have a tape of my show, like for festivals. I'm always like, I should submit to festivals. And I'm like, I've never taped my show because I have no desire to tape it or relive it or, um, or like sell DVDs or CDs or anything like that. I just like, let, I don't want to sell merch. I don't want to contribute to the garbage of, of the world. It's like, let's just have this moment together and love each other and, and, um, and have a laugh and you guys can buy me a drink after the show. Yeah. I love the idea of like the living in a moment of it. I also don't want crap. You know, and there also the <laughs> world, the world of, you know, there's hardly anything to give anymore. Like you used to have a DVD, like, would you give a DVD? Like, would you, you know, people used to sell CDs. I, no one's buying yeah. CDs. Like, are you going to hand out a thumb drive or like, like, what is it that you're yeah. giving? You know, I get, well, it's I also get like, certain yeah. like, you know, uh, uh, 
more famous comedians who want to televise yeah. their stuff so that you know the people who couldn't buy tickets to their shows can also watch it sure great do it up pay for that yeah. and enjoy paying for it like great i hope it does well for you and i enjoy watching them but like you know especially now that i'm home with the baby <laughs> i don't go out that much yeah. at all anymore so like i really love watching stuff online but at the same time there is something to the experience of the moment like scripted theater is for yeah. um or you know certain movies i guess but they're always leaning towards a script where even the ones that are improvised are like still improvised but not really like you know what's happening um yeah. you're not going to change the plot of the film if you guys have an epiphany like it's not going to happen but like yeah i think there is something important to connecting in a room with other people and I feel like, um, especially with improv, like improv and anything I do probably wouldn't translate to watching online later anyway. I mean, so much of it is just like the moment and improv. I feel like it's so much the vibe in the theater and like the audience, like, like really good improv. Like, I feel like sometimes you can see what's coming next, but there's a beauty in the way they got to this journey that it's kind of exciting. Um, and so, like, maybe, like, like when you're doing, like, a third beat and the audience knows it's coming and then, like, they knock it out of the park. Like, there's this thing in the room that's kind of energetic that doesn't come through when you're watching uh, on a video. Um, but, yeah, yeah, I'd rather just, like, have – I'd just rather have, like, 50 people in a room watch this live event that I'm performing with and just have a great time. Um are you currently and focused on the experience of performance right now, you know, or are you still teaching? Um, I mean, I try to do, I try to do workshops. Uh, the one workshop that I'm really trying to get off the ground and work off is uh, improv in like a two hour intro class for trans and non-binary people. Um, Cause earlier, earlier this summer, uh, someone was doing a feature on me and they asked me if I would ever do like, an all trans girl improv troupe. And I was like, well, if I knew any other trans girls who did improv, I'd love to. And so I called around to like all my friends who are all over the country and didn't really get much feedback. Um, I'm the, I found like two that I've talked to. Um, and so that's been great, but I'm like, you know, improv was so transformative to me. And like, um, I feel like if you have gender issues, like if you're not feeling like if you're, you know, born with male genitals and, um, you don't feel that way, like you, that you're kind of out of control of your life. And improv was a way for me to gain control, even, even just starting like the most minimal, like the first time I did improv, it's like, I'm controlling what I'm doing and no one else, like I'm completely in control. I'm my own God. And the more I did improv and the better I got at it, the more I felt like that control seeping through the rest of my life. And I just like, I just want other people to realize that, that like, it's a great way, like we talked about earlier, like, how do you find your voice? And it's like, we well, find your voice by getting on stage and saying what you feel, you know? Yeah. And, um, that's a, for me, it was also a great way to go through what I was going through, um, without telling people what I was going through. You know, I could play these characters, uh, on stage who were facets of the real me. And it just made me more comfortable and realize, you know what, this is, a, I'm an acceptable person. Um, I know that seems weird to say, but, you know, um, you feel a lot that way when you're trans, that you're not, what you are isn't acceptable or that um, something's not right. But living that on on stage without telling anyone that that was the real me kind of got me to the point where I'm like, you know what, I need to, I need to be me. Um, yeah. And so I just want to like, even if it's just like, a, like, like I said, a short intro thing, just to get, just to like have fun and like not be under any pressure to do anything. I know like I had some people like trans voices are so important. I'm like, honestly, a lot of us aren't looking to be the voice of our community. We just want to like find our own voice and be able to speak for ourselves. And if even that seems grand for what I'm talking about, it's just like, I just want you guys to come on and have fun and realize that you're amazing. Yeah. Um, it can be so hard to sort of accept who you are or, or to accept where you're at, you know, like <clears throat> I'm in my, you know, my own personal journey going from, uh, you know, single lady to mar married lady to mom and also trying mm -hmm. to navigate theater around that. And, uh, and yeah, even just like getting to the point where like at this point, 
Um, by the time this comes out, I will have finished the um, Neighborhood Sketch Comedy Show, which is a show that I've been producing for eight years. And I decided to stop yeah, no, doing I love it because it really just couldn't um, continue to do it in the state that I am involved because I'm involved much more deeply in the parenting side of my life. And so I have to give focus to that and not try to put out a show that I can't give my full attention to. And it's just interesting because for me, I'm like, oh man, what's my voice going to be? So it's always interesting to hear somebody, um, cause you're only a couple years older than me and I'm like, yeah, okay, great. I'm looking forward to my own next renaissance. Like what's the next, uh, for me, I'm trying to figure out what I want to say to the world. What does, you know, 40 year old Amy think about the world and what do I want to express as an artist? So it's interesting. And I appreciate you sharing your journey to, um, being able to express yourself uh, in the most complete way possible because, you know, it's like, even though our, you know, perhaps the circumstances of our journeys are different, we're, all of us are going through trying to identify who we are and be the best person we can be. And especially with artists, we're all just trying to be like, what do I need to express? How how do I need to get this creative energy out of me and wh- how can I use it to both express what I feel and maybe also make people around me have a good time, like you said. So, yeah, yeah. yeah I appreciate you sharing that. It's super interesting. Yeah. And I think I've just, uh, yeah, like all that has come, like, like I said, just being on stage and uh, I was at a festival this weekend and um, the person I was on a, a show um, that someone put together and she just introduced me as fearless. And, um, <laughs> I've kind of, that's kind of always been like, I like kind of thing you don't want to say about yourself. Like, Oh, describe yourself. Like I'm fearless. But I mean, that's kind of the point I'm at where I'm on stage where it's just like, I'll go up there and, um, you know, what are we going to do? We'll just do it. And it's frustrating. Like when you're coaching or teaching and you tell people to do stuff, like you give people an exercise, and they have all these questions about, it, and you're like, well, just jump in. And like, well, I have a question. I need to clarify if this is right. And it's like, just do what you think it means. And then we can tweak it later. You know, like if I say, um, go out there with an emotion and you're like, so like anger, it's like, no, just yes, but don't, don't ask my approval. Um, and that's the hardest part about being a coach is like, I'm doing yeah. things. I'm not asking for approval. I want you guys to have that same thing. Don't want my, I don't want you to want my approval. I don't want you to seek uh, my approval. I want you guys to go out there and just uh, throw, throw caution to the wind and be fearless and discover whatever you can discover. Um, I once gave someone a letter and I told him to just, uh, he was going on a cross country trip. And I said, you know what? Just, you know, fuck the fuckers and hate the haters and then just do whatever the hell you want. And when he came back, he was doing a stand up set and I kind of didn't like something he did. And I said something, he's like, yeah, why should I listen to you? And I'm like, touche. Why should you listen to me? You do what you want. <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of my, that's where my mentoring kind of peters out where I tell you not to listen to anyone and listen to your heart. And then if I say anything that doesn't go against your heart, I'm in no position to like call you out on it. I think sometimes you're, you need a coach and sometimes you don't. In fact, I was going to ask you if you had a director for your one person show, like, are you trying to, do you have another person who like gives you notes or is every character brand new and you never come back to them? So the first show that I actually wrote, I did have a director for that because as much as I was just like, oh, I could do whatever I want. I wanted someone to be looking at it from a, from a, a point of view of like as a staged piece, like, is this working? How should this flow? And so that helped me a lot. But this current show, I mean, I usually just do it at festivals uh, or like shows where I'm traveling. So if I had director here locally, um, you know, they, I wouldn't, I wouldn't drag them with me to go see it. Um, and I'm just to the point where it's like, Oh, it's like a little improvised monologue and I can handle that. There's no structure to the show. It's like, um, I'll just have on a sheet of paper, maybe these characters I want to do. I mean, I did this at a festival, uh, earlier this summer and I wasn't, I was like nervous about what I was going to do. 
and I was backstage like 10 minutes before I was supposed to go on, and um, someone had ate, gotten Chinese food and left all the fortune cookies in the green room. And so I just scooped up all the fortune cookies and brought them on stage with me and did a bit where I played like a self-help guru who answered people's questions and used the, the fortune cookies to kind of um, guide my answers. And so, yeah, it's just kind of like fly by the seat of its pants. Um, like the less we do, the better. I'm starting a new bit where I try to talk about Harry Houdini, who lived in Wisconsin when he was a boy. And I tell this story about Harry Houdini while I'm trying to escape from a straitjacket. Um, do you ever escape? And so I'm just making... I, I've never done this. I haven't done this yet. And I there's no way I can escape from a straitjacket. Right. And so, honestly, my goal is if I don't escape, uh, I'm going to do this like my second to last sketch will be this this bit. And then I'll just do the last sketch in the straitjacket. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll just, we'll, we'll just do it. Um, and then I'll do the sing along in a straight jacket to close the show. Um, that's so funny. But yeah, so like, whatever crazy ideas I have, like going to the show, if there was like, like I'm I'm beyond the point of having a director being like, well, this needs to fit. I'm like, nope. Now each little individual monologue is going to have its own theme. Uh, I don't have to look for an overarching theme to the show. Uh, oh. Can all have fun. It's high audience interaction. I mean, I do a lot of stuff where I I did one. Um, I like to go thrift shopping before the show, and at one one venue, I found a uh, luchador mask in a thrift store, and I bought it, and then I just did a character called Luchador Life Coach, where I put on the luchador mask, and I gave people advice uh, for their careers if they were struggling, and it worked out great. The audience loves being a part of it, and I love the idea of just being, just stepping out there and being like, let's see what, let's see what uh, fate brings me tonight. That's so great. I feel like the show uh, is like a full embodiment of the like current creative state you're in. Like the experience yeah. everything, try it, let it be, let fate direct you. This it's the dreamlike state that you're in right now. Yeah, I'm just like I am ready to face whatever the world brings me. And uh I'm just going to step out there and we're going to, we're going to deal with it. And yeah, right? it's all, like I said, it's also a confidence thing where it's like, I mean, no one can throw a curveball I can't hit. So let's do it. Yeah. And now you, now you're fully you, now you're expressing everything that you've always wanted to express. And that's awesome and beautiful. And what a great thing for an artist to be able to do. Yeah. And it is, it's like the exact opposite of who I was, you know, before, like, you know, when you're trying to hide who you really are, because like we said, society deems unacceptable. Or like when I was a kid, I'm old enough that there weren't words for being transgender when I was a kid, you know, it wasn't something that was even talked about. Uh, and so now to fully be able to express my life just from moment to moment in the regular day um, makes being on stage even, even easier. You know, I can fully embrace everything I am and, and, um, and bring all of that with me to the stage. I'm so happy for you. Well, I'm happy for you too. I got all my, I got all my stuff oh, for yeah. the theater, all my gifts from the Kickstarter <laughs> from, from Fallout. It's amazing. I love, I love the, <laughs> the buttons in the shirt. It's amazing. I got it like the day you, the day you, the day you sent me the thing about what day we were going to do this. I got my t-shirt and I was like, oh, awesome. Oh, that's fun. Yeah. I, I, I uh, saw the team putting that all together. Saw everybody packing yeah. bags and putting, sending everything out. Yeah. It's yeah. Uh, it's and been the... a wild transition. I think it's, um, I think it, it, it speaks of, of what happened with the theater speaks similarly to, you know, finally being able to breathe without um, feeling like yeah. we had to be something we weren't. Yeah, you know? I'm so happy for you guys. And obviously, like, um, I've been working a lot with The Pit in Chapel Hill, hmm. which uh, used to be DSI, which kind of went through a similar thing with their leadership mm. and changed hands. So, like, yeah. all that happened all that happened kind of within, like, weeks of each other, it seems like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, a couple, um, it was a couple weeks. I, I remember. Yeah. 
Yeah. And so I'm just happy that you guys were able to to do whatever you could to to keep that going in Austin because I love your theater, I love your space, and I love all you guys that work down there. Um, just seeing you guys grow. Um, you guys were like really like an inspiration to me. Like there were, it was weird when I was down there for that month. It seemed like there were eight to ten people who were just doing everything, you know. Mm-hmm. And they were just, they were in all the shows. Yeah, yeah, that was pretty much it. <laughs> yeah, like, see, like, I'd come in, I'd come in on, like, Wednesday, and they'd be there on, like, a Wednesday afternoon working on their sketch show, which is, like, so great to see these guys who are dedicated to it. And so just realizing, like, the work that goes into being, uh, being the performer you want to be, and, like, my weakness has always been, like, reaching out to people and just asking to do shows and, like, just getting that hustle vibe going a little has helped me too. So, uh, but yeah, you guys were inspiring and you, you guys had like two sketch shows that ran, I believe. Right. I saw the neighborhood a few times. And there was another one that ran on Saturday night and I was just like, these guys are just working sketch shows so hard. And it was so beautiful and funny and amazing. And uh, yeah, it was really inspiring just to be around that vibe with you guys. Yeah. I appreciate that. It's um, it's always nice to, you know, leave the crowd that you're hanging out in and uh, and see how other people do it. And, and one of the things that's been great for me doing these phone interviews is hearing different ways that different communities function. Like, how do yeah. they... Like, do you take classes and then immediately go on stage? No, you have to do the, some other stuff. There are some places I've talked to where they're like, there are no classes here. I cannot take a class in the town where I live. We all just read a book together and decided to do improv. Like, so there's so many different ways to accomplish stuff that talking to people all across the country, across the world even has really made me feel very, um, very appreciative of the, the fact that Austin as a whole is such a like, you know, active improv city. There's so much to do. There's so many. So people. much. It's amazing. It's like it's like I when I realized that I was gonna stay here for the rest of my life, I was like, okay, uh-huh. it's fine because there's I can never do all the improv. There's no way. Like I could right. potentially take all the classes, but by the time I finish all those classes, something crazy is gonna happen. In fact. There was one guy, one guy who went, took all the classes at every theater before the new movement crumbled. The o- oh, one yeah? guy, he was the only person who finished all of them. Now there is the other guy who had did all, did, did all the other theaters and is now doing Fallout, but it's different. It's huh? like a different thing because Fallout's huh? different. It's got a different vibe. It's got a different syllabus, everything, you know? And so yeah. it's funny because it's like, it's like Chris Villafano is the one guy who knew, who, who like grasped onto the improv of that moment, which was like four or five uh-huh. years, you know, four or five years of his time spent doing that. But then the beauty of it is as soon as you finish, there's brand new people and brand new ideas. And all of a sudden there's comedy sports reopened in town. And it's like, what? There's so yeah. many different things. Like, I was like, oh man, now you can, now there's so many options for long form and short form. Like, oh, get out of here. Like, yeah, I mean, it's, it's good and it makes me appreciate it. And talking to people where they're like, I can't take classes. I have to drive six hours to take a class. I'm like, oh my God, I am so, I have everything. I can't believe it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And I always, I always tell people. Oh, definitely. Like, and to like have that, those options. Cause whenever I teach a class, I'll just tell people, I'm like, look, this is, this is my approach. I'm going to go over a bunch of stuff here. Some of it you might like, put that in your pocket and keep it. But if you learn something from someone else and you love it, just do it. That's how the, that's how I think I worry that like improv stagnates and that like we have like, this is what, this is what's happening in Chicago. This is how this works. And I'm like, no, let's, let's take all our little pieces and like, let's spread out. Let's let, let's push ourselves to be different. And yeah, if, if someone, t- if someone's doing improv right now and they took like one exercise from my workshop and they incorporate that into how they, how they're doing things like that more than makes me happy. Like I would, I hate the idea of like, uh, 
but the, and this is part of the problem with some like I'm, I think what you guys had down there and like what DSI had is like there's this guruism or like the messiah complex is like mm -hmm. I'm the guy who knows improv and I run this theater and we do these things my way and I'm like oh if anyone ever said they did uh, they're like I learned improv from Ellie Zarling and I do what Ellie does I'm like oh no go go you know dip your toe in other waters please you know yeah um I would never I would never I can't imagine walking around thinking that you know everything about improv and that your way is the one way to do it that's so weird yeah but yeah so it's great when you're in a city like Austin where there's like a bunch of different places that all seem to get along I know that for a while it wasn't like that but it seems like everyone's on the same page now or at least on friendly terms yeah it's definitely better I've uh I've interviewed people uh, across the history, like <clears throat> talk to people who have been around for many, many years. And I think um, across a few of the episodes of this podcast, you can get the complete history of uh, Austin Improv. I should put them together into a playlist <laughs> because like... That would the, be a good. There is, there are, you know, three or four interviews where I spoke to people who had been around since... Like the first thing was happening, which was one improv show at what is now the stand up like hub. Um, they just had one show and it was just people rehearsing and figuring it out. And then it bloomed into other things. So it's like um, it's it's interesting to see how things get born and then how they perpetuate. You know, everyone does get along now when when the new movement crumbled and the fallout was born from it. I don't think we could have done it without the rest of the community. The rest of the community came and had our back in such a immense way that I don't think, I mean, there were a lot of us that had mental breakdowns during the course of the whole experience of like, oh, wait, what the fuck? Um, and, and I, but I, I think that some of the people in town were just so supportive to the point where it was like, you know, they, they held us up, you know, like, like uh -huh. I didn't know what was going on. I had the neighborhood go to the hideout for two months because I didn't know if we even had a space anymore. And so I was like, okay. I was like, may I please do my show at your theater? I have it booked. I have it practically written. Can we, you know, and they're like, yeah, absolutely here. And they like gave me a, killer slot and i was just like oh my god and they were they took care of me you know what i mean at a time when i needed to be taken care of so it is nice yeah. it is nice and i think that's the benefit of the community that's the benefit of having uh being like i'm part of this right i appreciate what you were saying earlier mm -hmm. about the idea that like we are all creative individuals and so we have to express what we individually want to say and sometimes it goes with the community and sometimes it doesn't but the beauty, yeah. I think, of when an improv community works is that improv is an art that's about empathy and kindness. And there's not a lot of that in the world. And if you can find a place where you can spend time with other people and all agree to be kind to each other and try to look at the world from each other's perspective as well as you possibly can, I mean, I think that's the best we could hope for. Oh, that is an amazing sentiment. Yes, that's exactly what I want. And that, I mean, that also kind of ties back to, um, you know, with being trans and like traveling the South and doing shows down here. And I have people who tell me like, oh, you're going to North Carolina, you know, be be careful. And I'm like, you know, I feel it's important um, to just be down, just to be in those spaces and um, I don't really talk about being trans in my show. I'm just out there performing. But I think it's important to like be in this place where like maybe these people, the only thing they know about trans people is what they hear about on the news and like that we need to have laws to keep them from doing stuff. And just to meet a trans person who's funny and engaging and loves life and wants to love, wants them to love life is nothing but a positive. It can't be a negative, you know? Um, I feel that um, that's important. That's important for me is to just um, to be a trans person in a place um, where um, maybe I haven't necessarily been excluded, but no one's gone out of their way to invite me. Um, 
I feel like improv might have that issue where it's like no one in improv, I feel, is like anti-trans, but they don't make the effort to be like, hey, let's find trans people. Let's specifically find trans people to, to be an improv. And then the same problem with minorities, you know, um, that they don't they they're like, well, we're sending our message out. It's like, but you're sending your message out to your network of white dudes, you know. Like you have to make the effort to find these, these smaller things. Like no one's calling you a racist, but what are you doing to get black people into your theater? No one's calling you a transphobe or a homophobe, but what are you doing? What outreach are you doing to let those people know that you're here? Um, and so for me, it's important just to be like, I'm here and, um, I just want, I just want to enjoy life. And, uh, no one's come over the reason that, um, we should make laws that people can enjoy their lives. So I'm going to keep enjoying my life until, uh, well, forever. So, um, but you know, I hope yeah, that's I, like I, in I've the got first my line of the, now. of the constitution. So I'm pretty sure pursuit yeah. of happiness, we can keep trying. You can try. It's that's right the there. whole idea. It doesn't say you can have it. It just says you can try. So let's try. I can pursue it all I want. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So good luck. Good luck <laughs> editing that into something that that sounds like I'm not insane. But basically, it's like, yeah, no. it's an important part of this. Important part of this is to, like, just be out there and be visible and be relatable um, to people. And there are other yeah. trans comics who talk about being trans. and That's totally cool. And that's important as well. But for me, it's just like. I don't know. I feel like my transness sometimes is like the least interesting thing about me. And it's like, um, <laughs> I just, it, it is. And I've said that before and everyone's like, really? I'm like, yeah, like I have a lot of cool thoughts and shows and, and ideas that I want to share with the world. And, um, yeah. I just happen to be in a trans package, you know? Totally. And if, if that, yeah. So if that can help someone who like had never met a trans person before relate with me, then that's great. I mean, I did a show this weekend in, um, I did a show this weekend and I just, it was specifically a storytelling thing. So I was talking about being trans and I just asked the room like, well, who here has or knows someone who's trans and only like half the room did. So, um, the other half got to hear some real human and personable and kind of funny stories from me for 20 minutes and hopefully it had a positive effect on them. Yeah. Good. That's so great. Thank you so much for sharing the story good. with me and sharing um, your experiences because I really, I, I think you're right that there are artists out there who are trans that don't know or don't feel like they're welcomed into communities. And I, um, if anywhere is welcoming people, come to improv. I mean, I don't know what town you're in, so maybe not great. If you're in Austin, come to yeah. improv. It's great. Um, but improv in general, you know, is, is certainly a positive thing. I know that there can be competition in some cities, New York and LA. I'm terribly sorry. I don't know what's happening there. Um, their improv isn't right, but, um, but, uh, uh, uh it's just about being famous somehow. Like, mm, okay. Uh. Sure. That sounds That's fun. the last thing I want, so yeah, whatever. Yeah, Ugh. yucky. But you're right. I, I, I really, I, I'm excited to have your message be out there, so that you know more artists feel like they can truly express their art, no matter what else is going yeah. on with them. Yeah, I mean, and I get, I like I said, I get all the fears. I mean, I lived. I lived with this, you know, as a secret for 45 some years, you know, so I get that hesitation to like be yourself and to like express yourself freely. But when you come on, when you come through the other side, it's, it's pretty amazing. Um, and I also understand that, you know, everyone doesn't have the same experience as I do as well. And there's always complications, but you know that there are always people out there who, who do want to help you and who got your back. And, um, uh, you know, small steps. Like, it, uh, I was at a, I've always told people, like, especially when they're just beginning their transitions, like, honestly, it's just taking that first step. You know, for me, it was just cross dressing in public. And I gained that confidence and discovered my own journey, you know. And until you take that first step, though, you're never going to get to, to where you want to go. You're never going to find all that. You're never going to really discover yourself until you to say, you know what, I'm going to do it. I'm going to 
be the best me I can be and discover where that, where that takes me. Um, so yeah, if you're, if you're having doubts and stuff, just go do it. I love it. Awesome. Well, Ellie, thank you so much oh. for uh, taking the time to uh, chat with me and um, taking time out of your, you know, <clears throat> busy performance and, uh, and preparatory schedule. So I really appreciate you taking the time that's, to chat. That's all right. I'm in the sick bed today. Hence the, uh, the sexy Kathleen Turner voice I'm giving you, oh. um, oh. You, you know, the little, yeah. little, little gravelly there. Um, well, it's that time of year, and, uh, you know, I figure everybody's a little stuffed up. Yeah. Seasons change and everyone gets that cold right there. But, um, thank <laughs> you for having me on your show. It's been, it's been amazing. And, um, uh, I miss you guys so much. I, I definitely want to come down. Like, let me know when you guys do a festival or something and I'll, uh, I don't have a video to send, but I'll apply however I can with <laughs> a video and I'll come yeah. to Austin and have fun with you guys. Totally. Oh, so fun. I'd love to do Thank it. Thank you so much. Of course. And good luck with the new, with the new venture. I really employed for you guys and I want that. I want Fallout to succeed so much. Yeah, me too. Me too. They're good. They're good people that are the new owners and I'm, uh, I'm excited to support them in their journey. That's great. Awesome. Well, all right. Well, thanks for being a great guest. I appreciate your, um, sharing of stories and empowerment and, and, you know, you just, you, you give me a new view on, on my own, um, uh, creative journey as well. And I just appreciate it. We'll go you were a great teacher the world, that maybe. I enjoyed, and and I'm glad that you get to teach me again in a different way. Aw, you're welcome. And thank you, like you said, it, it means so much to me to just get a chance to talk to you, so it was mm. great. Awesome. All right, well, adios. Enjoy the episode, everybody. <laughs> oh, <laughs> goodbye. <laughs> All right, thanks so much. Appreciate it. Talk to you later. I'm sorry, I lost you there for a second. No worries, and I'm laughing so saying... hard because this is like this. I hope that we use this for the close up for the episode and it just goes on for 30 seconds with us thanking each other for talking to each other. Yeah, no, that's absolutely the end. Anybody well, who's going to listen much, to the end is, uh, is already in love with us. So if people, by the time people make it through, like if they've made it through an hour of listening to our conversation and they're still at the end, they want to be part of that joyful love fest in the that last month. Oh, yeah. The, this is the encore of love. If you're still listening to this, I love you so much. <laughs> um, I'll cut it off before this. No, it's definitely say that. Like, if you're listening to this last word of the episode, I love you more than anything or anyone in the universe, and you're a special person, and you deserve all the happiness in the world. And that's from Ellie Zarling, who's a fearless badass, according to the MC of the show she was on this weekend. Thanks for listening to Yes But Why Podcast. Check out all our episodes on YesButWhyPodcast.com or check out all the content on our network, HC Universal, at HCUniversalNetwork.com. <laughs>